what's the point of countries? What's the points of citizenship to, to any individual country in the first place, if that's, if that's the case? In a way, I just want to bite your bullet and say, yeah, like I think you know, countries are really overrated, <laughs> <laughs> right? And yes, it would be a much better world if people could just move from country to country um, and would be fr- perfectly free to go and live and work any- anywhere they wanted. That is Brian Kaplan. He's a bona fide libertarian, and for most problems he tackles, two things are usually true to him. We're deluding ourselves, and free markets are probably the answer. Above anything else, he urges us not to listen to words, but to watch people's actions. Actions speak louder than words. One of the really great things about markets is we don't just listen to people and have them say, oh, Central Park, we shouldn't lose a foot of that. Which one is actually more important is revealed by actions, by what people will pay for it. He's a professor of economics at George Mason University, a research fellow at the Mercatus Center, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and paradoxically, someone who argues that the education system is mostly a waste of time and money. The best thing to do would be to slash this funding dramatically, put me out of a job. I accept that. Brian is the author of eight books with a ninth on the way, and for this, he's been published in places like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and appeared on places like ABC, BBC, Fox News, and many others. Across his work, he leaves no assumption on questions, no elephant in the room unaddressed, reminds us that there's a limit to any idea and no real absolutes. It's like, well, like you should never go and punch a child in the face. What if you have to punch the child in order to prevent the destruction of the world? We spoke about rationality, open borders, the case against education, why parenting is overrated, the dangers of housing regulation, and picked apart some other counterintuitive ideas. If the education system is so broken and we're doing such a bad job of it, why are you a professor? Why, why contribute to the, uh, to the problem in the first place? Yep. This is the Labossier Podcast. Welcome to the new narrative. What do you think are the most irrational beliefs in society today? I guess I would just start with what I talk about in the book. So I think probably the biggest one in politics is just a great underrating of markets, a great overrating of government, an insistence that because people in markets are motivated by greed, that then the outcomes are going to be bad, despite the fact that if you just look with your own eyes, it's very clear that the business world serves you a lot better than government ever does. And furthermore, the countries that rely upon the markets the most are just the best countries in almost any sense that you can think of. Uh, also, probably, you know, especially a fear of economic interaction with foreigners. The actual gains that we get from interacting with the world were so great. The potential is so high. Uh, in my book, Open Borders, I just talk about how we really are almost totally shutting down the most important labor, we are almost totally shutting down the most important market on earth, which is the labor market. It is so hard for talent to move across borders. And why? Uh, the arguments against, I say, really are extremely emotional and just innumerate, just not considering, look, even if your complaints are true, these are billion dollar complaints compared to a trillion dollar opportunity. In terms of people putting their, you know, vote where their mouth is, or, or however, you, <laughs> however you want to say that, um, you also sort of mention in some of your writing that, you know, most voters in a modern democracy tend to opt to not fully understand policy, um, given the high costs and the relatively like small likelihood that their singular vote is actually going to matter in context anyway. Why do people vote in the first place? Well, I would say that it's a lot like going to church. People are, are part of a religion. It's not like they're that intellectually engaged by the doctrines, most of which people can't even explain what the doctrines of the religion are, but there is the social part of, I go and participate, I'm doing this. In the case of voting, there's such a civic religion of it's evil not to participate, and on the other hand, it's maybe not wonderful to participate, but definitely you're bad if you don't participate. I think that's a big part of it as well. I mean, really, for a lot of people, this is their functional religion, is being part of the of the conversation about what policies we ought to have and just like with religion there's not that much effort not that much interest in the doctrines but there's at least more in being part of it making it making a difference even if the difference is not really well calculated to be good 
maybe this sort of touches on religion in, in some ways, but there's also this argument that like altruism in any way when you're voting or selflessness in any way when you're voting is actually the wrong answer. And in this sort of free market way that being selfish and voting for your own interest is, is kind of the most economically efficient way of going about it. Is that, is that right? Mm. Well, what I would say is there's nothing irrational about caring about other people. There's nothing irrational about caring about all people. It is irrational to think that you are going to make a great difference in politics such that this is really the best use of your time. Um, this is not the best format for going over the math, but, I, uh, but if you do go over the math of philanthropy, I think it's very clear that for almost everyone, it is much better for them to just go and take the time they would have spent on politics and make and work a little bit extra and make a donation to a charity for deworming or for malaria nets or something like that. Sure. So I want to flip the first question I asked you on its head now, sort of putting all of this in context. What do you think are the most net positive social delusions in society? Hmm. The most po the most net positive social delusions. Uh, it's a good way that you put it that put it that way because individually, almost by definition, a delusion can't help you, right? But at the level of society, let's see. Hmm. I mean, well. I mean, this, I don't think this is the right answer. It's the first one that comes to mind. And it's just the delusion that you are quite likely to be caught for doing serious crimes. <laughs> so I think that a lot of people are deterred by, by exaggeration. Uh, in a country where the laws are bad, this is really just making a bad situation worse. Of course, in the countries where the laws are bad, probably the punishments actually are generally pretty harsh, at least for the laws that are best to break. Like if you're in a horrible dictatorship, probably the actual likelihood that you'll be caught if you become a thought criminal is really high. In terms of what would be a better answer, hmm. I would think not so much in terms of delusions as just not focusing on negative things. I think if people were to focus a lot on the reality that they're going to die and everyone they love is going to die, that would be pretty depressing and make people unhappy. It's not, I don't think that people are not deluded about this. I don't think there's many people saying I'm never going to die. But if it's one where they dwelt on it a lot, I think it would be bad for them. Gotcha. So, I mean, to the, to the point of this miracle of democracy and this averaging of extremes, um, maybe the wisdom of the crowd sort of being the right answer after all, as long as they're voting in their own interests at the end of the day. What do you think about the sort of main bottlenecks in democracy. I mean, the, the, the way that I tend to think about this is that it, it's oftentimes what determines who gets on ballots in the first place. And, and primaries, I think, for instance, are a great example of this and the types of people that sort of turn out to vote in primaries. Do you think about like voter turnout as being a major bottleneck for, for democracy? No, I mean, I think, I mean, honestly, I think of those problems as being quite trivial. And there, there are other political systems, other democracies that don't have primaries, for example, and yet, when you look at them, they don't seem to be all that much better, if they're better at all. I think the main bottleneck is just human emotionalism, treating politics like a religion. That's the real issue. And it's one where it's very fundamental. It's just very hard to find people for whom politics is not a religion. Uh, people who actually want to calm down and think about issues, it's just very rare. Uh, in the book that I'm writing right now, the concept that I used to organize it is what psychologists call social desirability bias basically just means that when the truth sounds bad, people lie, and often the lies become so ubiquitous that they just stop thinking of them as lies. I think this is really the main issue, that these are, you know, you know, political issues, they're complicated, they're hard, but more importantly, the answers are often generally very ugly. Mm. The true answers are ugly, and politicians then will not face the ugly truths, and they form policies on the basis of pretty lies, which gives you bad results. So to your point, the new book, Voters as Mad Scientists, one of the new books, well, it always seems like you have a new book. Um, the main cause of bad policy is bad thinking, right? And the democracy's main problem isn't that voters are selfish, but they're altruists with foolish views about how to help the world, which begs the question of how to improve thinking. And I think this sort of points to the idea of an idea trap. So why don't we start there? What is an idea trap and how do you reduce the number of idea traps? All right. So uh, the idea trap, it's a idea I came up with to explain some puzzles primarily in the world of global development. So here's the issue. If you look around the world, 
the countries that are doing the worst generally do not catch up to the rest of the world. Right? So if you're saying, like, what countries are going to do really well? It says, well, intuitively you might think the countries that are most screwed up are the ones that are going to improve the fastest because it's obvious that they're screwed up. All they need to do is say, hey, look over there. There's some countries that work better. Okay, let's just copy them. Obviously, what we're doing is ridiculous. Let's stop. Uh, but in the real world, it doesn't work that way. Countries that are failing generally continue to fail. And then the question is, why? All right. Uh, when countries do actually start to improve, normally there is this Panglossian story of, oh, well, of course. They were doing badly. They realized they were doing badly. And then they said, all right, let's stop doing badly. Let's learn from our mistakes and improve. All right. Now, this is a good story about the rare exceptions of countries that do get out of their bad position. But it doesn't really fit the general story, which is that normally countries are doing badly just keep doing badly. So anyway, I came up with a, a simple model where you've got three variables. So you've got you've growth, you've got policy, and you've got ideas. All right. uh, so growth is, just you know, think of it as economic growth. It's whatever is uh, the standard result of having good policies. Uh, you know, policy is whatever it is that countries are doing in order to go and change growth. And then finally, ideas are whatever is behind the policies that countries adopt. All right, now, um, this is complicated, but I'm happy to go over it. Um, so what I say here is, right, look, you know, good policies, good policies cause good growth almost by definition. Good ideas cause good policies almost by definition. So really, the hard part of this model is what's the interaction between growth and ideas. So basically, think about it as a circle. We've got growth, we've got policy, we've got ideas. They all feed into each other. And what I say is that if we have the standard view that when growth is bad, people will change their minds, then we actually are stuck with the implication that bad countries will catch up and will repent. So on the other hand, suppose we go and we flip that assumption and say, no, no, that's not how it works, actually. And the real story is that when growth is bad, people actually stick with bad ideas. And I say if you do that, then you actually get what social scientists call multiple equilibria. This basically means that the three stable possibilities are you know, good growth, good ideas, good policy, mediocre growth, mediocre, mediocre policy, mediocre ideas, or finally, bad growth, bad policy, bad ideas. And then from there I say, well, it's really this second version of the model that actually fits the facts. Uh, then, in this piece, I go over just different examples. The main thing to think about is this. I mean, I realize this is a lot to just have a hold in your head. But basically, just imagine that a country is going down the tubes. How optimistic are you that people will say, oh, we're going down the tubes. Let's do the opposite of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And how likely is it that a country that's going down the tubes will just go and find an even crazier person to go and start screaming over te the television as a lat guy? That's the guy to listen to. Why, why is that? I mean, like, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, individual rationality almost as being like the correct answer here, how do we correct our thinking or improve our thinking? You have this idea called the ideological Turing test, which yes. I think is pretty interesting. Right. So I'd say there are so many ways to improve our thinking. The main issue is just the people who are not thinking clearly are not interested in thinking clearly. And so they do not avail themselves of the actual techniques that would work. Uh, the ideological Turing test is... Uh, inspired by the original Turing test by uh, the famed Alan Turing, uh, one of the founders of computer science. Uh, he basically had the question of, what standard could we use to decide whether an artificial intelligence is really at least intelligent? And his answer was, let's go and do a test. We'll have a test where there's two rooms. Inside of one room is a computer. Inside of another room is a person. We will go and pass notes under the door, not knowing who is behind that door. It will then get fed into the machine or the person. They will give us output, slide it back under the door. We won't be able to tell whether it's handwritten or by computer. We'll use the same font. And then the AI has passed the, the uh, Turing test if it is not possible for people to tell the difference between the computer and the human. All right, so that's Turing. My idea was we do a test between a sincere advocate of a view and a critic. And what we do is ideally we get a panel of people who are also highly informed proponents of a view, and they get to go and pass notes under the doors. 
and on the one on, behind one door is on one of their peers, someone who's also a sincere, thoughtful, high quality advocate of view. Under the other door is the critic. And what we say is the critic has passed my ideological Turing test if it is not possible for that panel of experts who sincerely hold the view to tell the difference between the sincere adherent and the critic. So let's say we had like, I don't know, Turing test for, for voters. Maybe this isn't the right, maybe this isn't right. the right way of, of saying it. But if you were to sum up like the average left-leaning voter versus the average right-leaning voter in the U.S. today, what's the caricature that you're drawing? Hmm. I mean, the caricature, I guess, I would, you know, so I have a general story about the left for the last 200 years and around the world, and my, the caricature is the left is anti-market. It's just very hard for them to like markets. does not mean that they hate markets. It just means that if you take anyone who self-identifies as left-wing and say, tell me something good about markets, and then stop without any qualification, without taking it back, that's what chokes in their throats. In terms of the modern American left, I would say that the anti-market stuff, while it's definitely a big part, it still takes a backseat to being really upset about racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia. Mm. Uh, so that, I, what I would say, is what they are especially worked up over right now, but at the same time, uh, also markets angry. So what do we misunderstand about these two kind of caricatures, if we want to call them that. Like, if I'm a political scientist or I'm a political strategist, like, what do I get wrong about influencing these people? Hmm. I mean, I would say that most political strategists actually know their stuff, and they're good at what they do. Uh, it's demagogic, but demagoguery works because this is what we've got. So we've got you know, one demagogue after another, right? And I would say, you know, say that if you're going to be honest, it's easy to go and call the other guy a demagogue, but your own guy's a demagogue too. If you just go and read a printout of what he says and go sentence by sentence and say, is that statement literally true? No. Is, that, is it literally true? No. Uh, PolitiFact, where they go and rate politicians from telling the truth to pants on fire, I say that they are ridiculously overly optimistic because they're not going to call you a liar when you say, we will do everything in our power to help Ukraine which is, of course, actually a lie. Right. Right. And that will not be called a lie because they only consider it possible to assess the truth of specific claims, like I was eating pancakes on July 28th. They don't want to consider it a lie when you say something that is just obviously untrue. Mm. And yet I say, look, why don't we consider those other things to be lies too? Gotcha. Let's talk about open borders. So let's say you're president, you're in your second term, you don't really have any incentive to like lie to people. Um, the assumption that, as, as I understand it, is that we're kind of admitting, you know, Einstein's out of self-interest because we don't want them to go to Russia or, or to go to China. Otherwise, immigration is kind of this form of international philanthropy. So what's like the elevator pitch here for, for open borders? The best way of thinking about it is this. Right now, there's an enormous amount of talent that is stuck in countries where it cannot realize its potential or come anywhere close. Think about what you could accomplish with your life if you were stuck in Haiti. There are many countries that are just very bad for productivity. There are other countries that are really good for productivity. And we can see with our own freaking eyes that if you just stamp someone's passport, you can come here, you can work here, that the earnings of people in poor countries multiply many times, literally overnight. You actually can easily make 15 times as much money in Miami as you were making in Port-au-Prince the week before. You can hit the ground running. If you're th wondering, like, how can that possibly be? Well, so that American employers are 15 times nicer than employers in Haiti? That doesn't make much sense. It's gotta be that you were just so much more productive in a productive country that this one and the same person can suddenly multiply the productivity, right? Once you think about this, then it really does come down to we can get an enormous increase in the productivity of humanity by letting people move from countries where their productivity is low to countries where their productivity is high. Uh, if there's any doubt about this productivity change, it's really easy to say for something like agriculture. You take a Mexican farmer from his farm in rural Mexico, move into American farming, see that guy is growing 10 times as much food as he was before. This isn't just the obvious thing of when Mexicans leave Mexico, Mexico's GDP goes down, US GDP goes up. 
it is that the Mexican GDP goes down by a little bit. U.S. GDP goes up by a lot because that person's productivity is so much higher in the high productivity country. You can see the same thing for manufacturing, of course. You are going to produce a lot more in a modern factory than in whatever kind of primitive production you're doing in your home country. For services, this is the one where it is a bit harder to tell until you realize the value of a service is saving time. When you save the time of someone who has higher earning, you are actually doing more for humanity again. When you save five minutes of Bill Gates' time, you're doing a lot more for the world than when you save five minutes of my time because Bill Gates does so much more for humanity with his time. That's why cutting the hair of Bill Gates is so much more productive for the world than cutting the hair of a person that is with you in Haiti. You've saved them, in both cases you save time, but you're saving the time of someone who is much more productive in a rich country. So that's why productivity is up. Now then, once you accept this, I say the only issue is, can we do this a million times? Can we do this 10 million times? Can we do this 100 million times? That's a harder question. Mm. But I would say if a person cannot, or if, once a person accepts that letting one more person in is tremendously beneficial for the world, then the only question is, how many times can we do this? Right. right. right? And then really, all of the intellectually strong arguments against this position come down to saying, yes, of course, it is awesome to let in one person, but if you let in too many, then there's going to be some negative side effect. Right, and that's really what I talk about in my book, Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration, is to say, no, actually, the simple story is right. And the fears that, there, that eventually something that is obviously really good in small numbers becomes really bad is actually wrong. The thing that is really good in small numbers is even better in large numbers because we are multiplying the gains by a larger number of people. So, I mean, to the sort of what this looks like at scale question, let's say totally open borders and people are you know, willing and able to, to move to other countries and work for willing employers and run from willing yep. landlords. I guess the, the larger question that pops up in the back of my head is, are, aren't we discounting sort of natural social issues that arise from this? Like even, even at a very base level, humans are pretty tribal creatures. Mm -hmm. This is kind of how we've organized ourselves pretty naturally over time into these states and countries and, you know, local governments. And um, is that like a major concern here? It could be. Right? I'm not the kind of person who, when someone says that, I go like, oh, you horrible person, how can you say that? Um, rather, what I would say is this. Right? So, in terms of you know, human beings are tribal. And step one is I would say, all right, like, how tribal? Mm. How much are you willing to give up for this? Mm. Right? How much would someone have to pay you to go and live in a neighborhood where you were the only person from your group? Mm. Right? Or how much cheaper would it have to be in order, for, in order to get you to do that? Um, normally, when people make these tribal arguments, they are thinking about it at the political level where the cost of going and saying, I vote to keep my tribe pure is basically nothing, right? You just go and vote to do it and like the odds that, that you actually have to pay anything personally for that next to nothing. Uh, so I say, if we really want to find out how tribal we are, let's look at their actions, not their words. And here we can see quite clearly is people may say, oh, well, like I want to be around my own kind. All right, how much effort are you actually going to take? How much um, extra money are you actually willing to spend in order to live in a neighborhood of, say, only native-born Americans? And I say, just look around. The actual answer to this is next to nothing. People actually, though they care vocally, they will vote for it. The amount that they actually care is demonstrated by their behavior is really low. I got this question multiple times from podcaster Andrew Sullivan. Now, here is me imitating Andrew, imitating Andrew's brother. You know, Andrew, London's not England anymore. <laughs> now, the complaint here is Andrew's brother lives in London. He wants to live in this world of the past when it was at least ethnically much more homogeneous or culturally more homogeneous. And my answer to, the, to Andrew was, look, could your brother live in a low immigration part of England if he wanted to? Of course. But so why doesn't he? Right, because the actual amount of value that he puts on this cultural homogeneity is in fact quite low. While he's complaining vocally, he is not willing to actually take much of an action. If we were to go and say, you know, Andrew, it's 3% worse for me now, that might be an honest answer. But it's also not the kind of answer that people care about in politics. Politics is about hyperbole, the end is nigh, the end of the world, right. things are terrible, right. we'll bring you paradise. So yeah, I don't think that this pure tribal story 
is just descriptive. It's not how people actually are. Rather, this is the kind of thing people say they care about a lot, but actually don't. So, I mean, your, your argument here is basically like, don't, I mean, look at what people are saying, look at what they're actually doing, how they're voting with their feet. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so even if someone were to say, okay, what if we were to look at a country like Japan or Sweden, yeah. where it's just like totally homogenous. Um, well, Sweden's not anymore, actually. That's okay, so yes, less so, yeah. maybe Japan yes. is a better example that like, even if we're talking about sort of like the short term social costs of this as far as like social trust or erosion of liberty or any of these other mm -hmm. things go, um, that like, yes, people will sort of yell about it a lot, but ultimately what actually matters is where they go. Do they choose to live somewhere else? Okay. Okay. Um, I heard you bring this up earlier, but I'm also interested in this in the context of just different value sets from different people who live around the world. I think this is something that, you know, Europeans tend to complain about a lot. Um, is that, you know, rights of women or LGBT people or, or you know, any other marginalized group aren't necessarily seen in the same light in different countries around the world. So how do you sort of contend with this idea of very different ways of life and values that's kind of coming together in the same place? Mm -hmm. I'd say that that's a lot of the, of the beauty of private property is that it allows a bunch of different things to all happen simultaneously. You do things your way on your property. I do things my way on my property. It's also a big part of the world of business. Different businesses cater different kinds of customers. These are the customers that want to have a gay bar. These are the customers that want to have a conservative church. They can all coexist by virtue of private property. Like, I don't have to get my way everywhere. I get my way in my place. You get your way in your place. Um, so I'd say that is the way that almost all societies do handle these problems. Uh, the main issue is just that people don't like to fully bite this bullet and just say, let's stop arguing and privatize this thing so that it's no longer something where people that disagree are getting on each other's nerves. So let's zoom out here, right? Like it, it seems that, you know, you don't necessarily believe that countries have any like super special obligations to their, to their citizens in any way. What's the point of countries? What's the points of citizenship to, to any individual country in the first place? If that's, if that's the case. Hmm. I mean, in a way, I just want to bite your bullet and say, yeah, like I think, you know, countries are really overrated, <laughs> <laughs> right? And yes, it would be a much better world if people could just move from country to country. Um, and would be fr perfectly free to go and live and work any anywhere they wanted. Obviously, there's still going to be some tendency of people to stay where they're born. There's be a people get a do of attachments. They've got their friends and family there. Even within a country, of course, you see people often stay in whatever city or town they're born in. But yeah, at the same time, I would say this is like, this you know, kind of you know, this sense of national identity is greatly greatly overrated. And again, I'll say it's not just my opinion. It is the opinion of almost everyone as revealed by their behavior. Right, so yes, people will stay in the town they grew up in, unless there is a job where they can double their pay if they would just move away, and then it's like, well, on the one hand, uh, I did grow up here. On the other hand, there are fantastic opportunities elsewhere, and I think I'm gonna use those. Uh, my friend Lent Pritchett has a great piece saying that within a country, it's just extremely rare that you get a pay ratio of even two to one, or be, you, you probably like, said, like the upper bound is usually like three to two, before mobility kicks in sufficiently to go and get that gap down. Gotcha. Different kind of question for you. What values are non-negotiable for you? What values are non-negotiable? I mean, even that I would say is too strong because it's like, well, if I'm really caught between a rock and hard place, non-negotiable is, is, is too much. I'll say uh, it's much more fruitful to think in terms of moral presumptions rather than things that are absolutely not negotiable at all. So mostly non negotiable. Right. Yes, mostly non negotiable. Um, yeah, so, you know, you know, leaving other people alone if they leave you alone, I think that's really important. Uh, you can call this the presumption of liberty uh, to not go and use violence against another person, not take their stuff. That one is a big one. Um, let's see. But I mean, honestly, the, there are so many different principles that I'd say there are at least strong presumptions in favor of. I mean, if I were just to come up with a slogan, Honestly, the slogan is you know, common sense and common decency. I'm very happy to talk with all kinds of people, but uh, when someone starts, starts saying things like, oh, well, um, you know, let's see, um, you know, maybe starting tomorrow, everyone's gonna start giving away all their money. It's like, yeah, uh, no, they won't. That just goes against common sense. That's crazy, right? And again, you know, common decency. It's like, I don't want to go and round up all those people and send them to some horrible place. Like, 
what are you talking about? Uh, these are human beings. You can go and say, I don't want to talk to them anymore. Don't want to interact with them anymore. But you can't go and round people up. That's terrible. Uh, so these are, again, things where it's like, you know, no, so you know, like just, just to um, you know, show where I'm coming from. So like I do have a minor in philosophy. So one of the main things you get in philosophy is weird hypotheticals. It's like, well, like you should never go and punch a child in the face. What if you have to punch the child in order to prevent the destruction of the world? Sorry, fine. Punch the kid. So mostly right. non-negotiable. Yes. There's always, okay. A little bit more tactically speaking here when it comes to immigration. Um, one thing that I found really interesting is that on net, you know, immigration is always from like a net present value perspective, right? Like the cash flow that's sort of being brought to a country. It's always positive unless that person is not a high school graduate, I think is, is kind of the thing. So is that something to be solved for? Do you believe in mandating high school uh, diplomas for anybody that immigrates to the country? Right, now just to be clear, uh, it's a net present value of revenue for the government, mm. right? So that's an important distinction. So basically here what we're doing is we're saying if we go and sum all the taxes you and your descendants will ever pay and subtract the cost of all the services you and your descendants will ever use, then what do we get? All right, and then if we're breaking it down by education categories, then you're correct. Uh, for high school dropouts, that is the one group where it looks like it's negative. You can definitely find other subgroups where it's negative, like you look at the elderly, who, even if they can't collect Social Security, would be able to collect Medicare. Uh, my actual view here is no, uh, you, you should still let them in. If that bothers you, go and change the system of government benefits. But to say that because this person is going to be a net drain on the Treasury, therefore they should not be allowed here, I'd say that just goes against common decency. Like, how bad is this really? Especially remember that they are also likely to get a job where they are producing extra value. And remember that what I was talking about earlier, you should be thinking primarily about what is the production of humanity as a result. When that person moves, they are producing much more of humanity. Uh, even from the point of view of the self-interest of the people in this country, they are going to be the main consumers of that product. So... Uh, even if you were just saying, is it uh, on a net positive for native-born citizens or something like that, there's a, you know, th there's a big difference between net positive for the Treasury and net positive for, pe for people in this country, because there you're adding on actual production on top of tax payments. But, I mean, really, again, this just does come down to a thought experiment. It's like, well, let's see. Are there any native-born citizens who, if they have a kid, we can expect that kid to be a net negative? And the answer is yeah. All right, so if your parents are on welfare, then it's very likely that you are expected to be a fiscal drain on society. So should we then go and forbid the poor from having children? And I'll say, look, I can understand the argument, but that is a terrible thing to do to another human being. And if, this, if you think this really is a problem, then the right thing is to go and change the welfare system, but not go and take away people's freedom to decide how many kids they want to have. And I say the same thing for migration. Right. The right thing is to go and fix the welfare system, not take away people's freedom to migrate. But I'm, And when people say, oh, that's totally unrealistic, it's like, look, we have two different things that are both hard. One is a fundamental change in immigration policy. The other one is a fundamental change in, or it is not a fundamental change. It is a specific change in welfare policy. I say, look, it's at least very reasonable to think that getting specific changes in welfare policy is, would be easier. Right. When someone says it's just unrealistic thing, we could restrict welfare benefits for immigrants. It's like, well, but you think that you can go and get a total change in the immigration policy we have? Why not focus on your actual complaint if that is your actual complaint? Gotcha. Um, I guess to that note, to sort of zoom out a little bit more again, you know, it's all well and good that we can talk about this in, in the context of economics and that present value and, and sort of general welfare of people because of open borders. To go back to that point of, oh, London isn't London anymore and mm -hmm. any of that stuff, do you, do you see any inherent value in preserving culture? Or is that something that you think can just be maintained through private property, in your, in your point earlier? Hmm. I mean, I'd say those are totally compatible, right? You, something can have inherent value and it can also be preserved by private property. So like, you know, eating has inherent value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eating is preserved by private property. In terms of whether any particular culture has inherent value, this is where I will say that I'm a big believer in competition, not just for products, but for cultures. Mm. I think that if your culture is really all that great, it, should, you know, it, it will be able to pass the market test, or at least that is a reasonable standard. 
So I say, look, we've got an international market in movies. Some countries have made great movies. People all over the world love them. Other countries haven't. Say, well, um, that seems the, I, they, it seems to be a good case of the countries that are making the movies that are loved around, beloved around the world. That's a case of culture passing the market test. It is, though, not identical with having inherent value. It is a good way of assessing inherent value. Is this something that people for a very long time all around the world have enjoyed? Um, so that's what I would focus on. If it's at the question of, is it like really good to preserve a language that only 20 people on earth still speak? Then I'll say, yeah, like, what's the point? Uh, the, you know, the point of a language is to communicate with other people. You may say that it's got some really great literature. Like if it's that great, then you'll get some scholars to go and keep doing it. Again, probably actually not. Probably the languages that are widely spoken are also the ones that have a lot of great stuff for the very reason that they've got a lot more people doing work. So the best of the best of the speakers of English is just a lot better than the best of the best of the speakers of Albanian. I mean, to your point though, like, is a country's ability to export movies or media or anything else like tied to the inherent value of a culture? Or is it just tied to their ability to make movies in the first place? Hmm. I mean, say actually you know, making movies, like the cost is actually not even that high. So there's, there, are, there are countries that have done really well you know, culturally back when they were still pretty poor. And on the other hand, so like, you know, like, so like Japan was, um, you know, was doing quite well in terms of making movies back in the 50s when they were still just eking out an existence after World War II. You know, on the other hand, there's some countries that really just haven't done very much uh, for this. Again, I, I, just to be clear, logically it's possible that something can have great inherent value but nobody likes it. Mm. That's possible. Mm. Uh, however, I still think that if you are pushing the inherent value of some cultural product or some feature of your culture, it should bother you if you just can't get them. If you if you know, you know if you can't get other people to like it, if you can't even get your, the people that's, that are born with it to, to keep it, uh, that is a pretty plausible sign. Maybe actually this is not such a great cultural product. Here I think a lot about how Western culture is the kind of thing that non-Western cultures, will, especially dictatorships, will often very aggressively try to keep out because they realize if we go and let in Western culture into Iran, guess what? Iranians, despite being brainwashed from birth in the wonders of the Ayatollah Khomeini, are actually going to not want to consume that stuff, and they're going to want to consume Western culture. Right now, if they were to say, well, this is terrible, the market isn't respecting our inherent values, like, or maybe your culture has low inherent value, it's a terrible culture, and the Western culture is the better one, and you are trying to stop progress, progress that your own brain people that you have had decades to brainwash can see. So there is this line of you know, from the Jesuits of give me the child at seven and I'll answer for him as an adult. Mm. I'll say that's overstated. But still, if you can't even keep people that you have had a stranglehold on culturally for decades, it's like, huh, what is it about your, your way of life that is so unappealing that even when people are cut off from the rest of the world, they still keep saying, oh, over there, there's some other culture that I would... That just seems a lot better. Let me give that a try. So we've been talking a lot about what should happen or what you, know, you think the free market would be able to dictate. What about what will? Do you think that globalism is, at the end of the day, sort of inevitable? Again, inevitable is too strong, mm -hmm. but that the world is continuing to globalize despite a ton of complaining, sure. Again, it really does come down to this cultural competition. Cultures are competing. It's really hard to totally shut down competition, especially for cultural products because of the internet. And so stuff that people like around the world it tends to spread, and stuff that people don't like tends to die out. Um, so, yeah, I think that this general tendency towards globalization, it's really hard to get in the way of that just because of this combination of technology and competition. Um, I mean, doesn't mean that it's impossible, but yeah, I think you know, you know, very unlikely that the things will be turned back. In terms of like you know, globalization for products, that's a bit easier when it's a physical product, mm -hmm. and obviously it's really easy to keep out globalization for people, right? If you say, well, there's all this illegal immigration, it is a tiny, tiny fraction of what it would be if you could just move to another country for the pro for the price of a plane ticket. I hear where you're coming from with the sort of battle of cultures, but I, I, I will admit, I think it's more of a function of resources than maybe we're letting on here. Um, you know, the U.S., for instance, I think, you know, 
the machine of Hollywood is probably like a pretty good example of this. Like, yes, I can sit down in Albania and make a, a home movie or something, but at the end of the day, are, are we sort of comparing apples to oranges when it comes to battle of cultures? I, actually, I don't think so. Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. There's actually some reasons to think that it would be poor countries that would be would have an advantage in cultural markets because awesome. labor is cheaper in poor countries, and a very big part of cultural production is using labor. Certainly for live performance, this is really clear. For live performance, when people's time has, low, has a low market value, then uh, it is much easier to go and say, let's have a go and uh, let's stage a big play because we don't have to pay the people, the, pay the people all, this, all this much. Uh, in terms of movies, there's actually some kinds of movies that basically only get made in poor countries now. Uh, movies with the classic 1950s, A Cost of Thousands, right? You know, so movies like Ben-Hur or The Ten Commandments, they just aren't made in rich countries anymore because like, it's too expensive to go and get thousands of people together to go and shoot a scene. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Bollywood, they still do movies like that, right? In, you know, in China, they still do movies like that because labor is cheaper, right? Uh, there's also actually a lot of other examples of countries where they reached a, a cultural peak, or at least certain art forms, they reach cultural peaks uh, when they were much poorer. Uh, so, for example, I'm a big opera fan. The golden age of opera, I'm sorry, it, it, it isn't today. The golden age of opera was around 1900, and if you go and study what's going on, a lot of it is that back when Italy is really poor, becoming an opera star is a fantastic job. It's hitting the jackpot. And there's just a lot of people all over the country in poor villages going and practicing opera singing. And as a result, you just get a generation of fantastic singing. Uh, like I'm someone who generally thinks that things are improving over time, but when I hear the opera singers of the past, like, wow, we just aren't as good as they were. Right? And the same goes for a number of other art forms, generally these very labor-intensive ones, especially for live performance. But I mean, even in terms of recorded singing, I'll still say that this is where I think you really can see the advantage that they had from having cheap labor, such that there just aren't that, you know, that the, like, right, right now to become an opera singer, it's like, wow, you're giving, you know, like, you know, like, what's demand for that like, and what's the, what are the other options? But back then it was like, well, like, I could either be a farmer in this terrible, poor village, or I could sing at La Scala, which is, like, most could never even do. But, so actually, I would say that, you know, here's, like, another thing that's very labor-intensive, writing. Writing, maybe GPT is going to change that, but up until a few months, writing is super labor-intensive. So there's actually an edge in something like that for poor countries. Um, Again, like, it's not a, dec a decisive edge. You could also say, well, fine, you know, that the actual labor of the performance is cheaper, but we are better at mass distribution. That's true, too. But at least I'll say it's not clear that, that simply being rich is such, a bit, is such an advantage in cultural competition. So let's say you, Brian Kaplan, are president. We don't have open borders, but you're trying to increase the immigration of very talented people from across mm -hmm. the world. What are you screening for? What are you looking for most closely in talented immigrants? Hmm. I mean, honestly, I would say I'm just looking to go and define it as broadly as possible. Um, so, you know, like, if we, you know, so we do have this category, the immigrant of extraordinary talent, I'd say, wow, like, there's so much extraordinary talent. It's like tons of extraordinary talent. This guy's an extraordinary dish taker. I would just push the limits of it. In terms of the, you know, if I got a fixed budget of people that I could admit for the benefit of humanity, then I would be focusing on you know, who are people who are going to be founding companies, who are the people that are going to be coming up with highly marketable ideas, and in particular ones that would not be likely to do that if they stay in their home country. So basically you want to get the super talented people who are in countries where they repress innovation and entrepreneurship. That's where the delta, the change in how little they can do accomplish in their home country versus how much they can accomplish in the first world, that's what I'd be focusing on. So, yeah, like rescue North Koreans, for example. Like, it's like they're so crushed, so repressed there. And yet, if they're anything like South Koreans, they probably have immense potential in so many different ways. But, you know, not this you know, cultural potential, K-pop, K-zoms, K-drama. But in, term, in terms of business, they've got a, a lot of talent there as well. Let's see. So I mean, that's basically, I, I would be, you know, you know, profiling people that... Have, you know, you know, again, of course, you know, like you, you know, like you know, if you got a fixed budget, you don't want us to say let's do a country. It's like, all right, let's go and find you know the super high IQ people who, on top of that, seem to have a lot of ambition. Uh, my friend uh, Tyler Cowan runs uh, a charity called Emergent Ventures India, where he's just trying to find the most incredible people in India 
generally young people and give them some seed money to get started pursuing their dream. I mean, India is, in a sense, uh, better off because they are at least connected to the modern world. There's a lot of entrepreneurship uh, you know, coming out of India as well as from Indian migrants. I still say that that's a great bet to go and move them from being an entrepreneur in India where their likely peak is just a lot lower than it would be if they were in Silicon Valley, for example. Mm. So I'm looking, I'm actually looking at the book across the room right now, but I think this sort of calls for a little bit of level setting. So why don't you like walk us through kind of the, the thesis here? I think at the core of this is um, another fun term, the, the sheepskin effects, um, where the last year of a college degree is much more valuable than previous years. Walk us through it. All right. Well, suppose that you are a graduating senior and then you're one class short of graduation and you go, eh, I've learned what I need to know. I'm not going to finish. I'm not going to graduate. All right. Almost everyone that you know will say, stop, do the last class. Your parents will say, finish. Your friends will say, finish. Teachers will say, finish. Why? Because we almost all have a sense that it really matters. Like, how could it matter? Why would it matter so much? And the answer, of course, is there's a whole lot of jobs where the standard for even being considered is having a college degree such that if you don't have it, your application gets thrown in the trash. It's not that the college degree ensures you get the job, but not having it ensures that you don't get it in a lot of cases. Right? And then this brings us to the puzzle of how can the world work this way? It's pretty weird. Why would we have such a difference in treatment for someone who has 99% of their education versus all of it? The obvious answer is, well, there's some, you're saying something bad about yourself by not finishing. Mm -hmm. Right, so what does it mean? You're saying something bad about yourself. It's like you're revealing some underlying negative trait. What would that be? It's like, hmm, well, it seems like you're showing that you're some kind of person who is lazy or nonconformist. And it's like, oh, yeah. If you're an employer, do you want someone who's lazy or nonconformist? No. And yet, how do you find out whether someone is lazy or nonconformist? You can't just ask them in, in the interview. So, are you lazy? Uh, yes. Are you nonconformist? Yes. All right, you got the job. Yeah. All right. Anyway, so this is just one of the many facts that takes me to the thesis of, or leads me to the thesis of the case against education, which is that a lot of the reason why education pays in the labor market, and it does, is that you are not acquiring useful job skills, but rather you're getting a stamp on your forehead. You are getting certified. This person has the right stuff to finish, right? You've got brains, you've got work ethic, you've got conformity, all things that are desired by employers and you're hard to observe directly. So that's the main story. In terms of the individual student, it doesn't really matter why education pays, but from the point of view of education policy, it matters immensely. Because if the main thing going on in school is that people are learning useful job skills, then all the slogans about investing in people are actually true. On the other hand, if the main thing that's going on in school is that you're getting stamps in your forehead, the slogans are wrong. At least they are deeply misleading. And the predicted effect of getting your population more educated is not that you increase productivity, but rather that we get credential inflation. Credential inflation where once degrees become common enough, you need to get those degrees to avoid having your application thrown in the trash. You need more education to get a job than your parents or grandparents did for the very same job. And I say that is the dystopia that we are in. We're in a world where most jobs actually use almost nothing of what you learn in school. And yet, if you don't have that school, you can't even get your foot in the door. Um, the slogan form, we usually think about education as job training, but it's actually more of a passport to the real training, which happens on the job. So how much is that stamp on your forehead actually worth? It seems like a lot of what you go through is trying to isolate whatever that value is and put aside any biases, right? So you have something called the ability bias, which is that you know, uh, maybe the people that are going to college in the first place are more able in the first place. Yes. Um, how do you go about isolating that and what is that number? Great question. All right, so the answer is this is a ton of work and I'm hardly the first person to go and start looking at these questions. Uh, what is striking is that I'm almost the only person in all of academia who tried to take all the results that everybody had that held up and snap it all together and actually give a number, which is sad commentary on academia because it basically means you aren't really researching any of the stuff to get an answer that is intended to be used by anybody for anything. You're just trying to go and get a publication and then move on with your life. 
the main things to think about, first of all. Um, we could just say that college graduates make 70% more than high school graduates, therefore going to college will raise your earnings by 70%, but that's obviously crazy. There are differences between people who go to college and people who don't go to college, and the market is likely to recognize at least some of those differences. All right, so there I go and go read a lot of papers and did a bit of additional data work, mostly just relying upon what other people found. And I say, look, probably we should subtract out something like 40% of the observed difference in earnings as being actually not really causal, but it still leaves us with 60%. If you're a smart kid and you don't go to college, you're still probably gonna do better than the not so smart kid that didn't go to college. But if you're a smart kid and you go to college, then you're going to do better than you would have done if you had not gone to college still. All right, so I say we got like the 60% left. And then from there, the next question is, all right, well, uh, how much of this is actually reflects a increase in your productivity, an increase in your contribution to society, and how much of it just reflects these stamps such that you're able to go and get more of the value of what you're producing? Or maybe you're actually able to trick people so that you get more, you get paid better than you actually deserve. Right? Imagine you've got the fake Harvard diploma, so you talk your way into a really good job, but you aren't able to do it. Then you could easily be overpaid. Uh, so I go through a bunch of different approaches to that. In the end, my view is probably only about 20% of that payoff for of the uh, of that payoff for education reflects a rise in productivity. So if you were then to say, all right, so what does that mean for how much is education really raising productivity? Then my one number answer would be, all right, well, point, what's 0. 0.6 times point, uh, point 0.2? And that is 12%. So I'll say 12% of the raw earnings gap between people with different education levels is actually actually reflects an increase in productivity and all the rest is either phony in that it doesn't really work or it is not a social gain, but is only a gain for the individual because it's a way that you manage to make yourself look better. If the education system is so broken and we're doing such a bad job of it, why are you a professor? Why, why contribute to the, uh, to the problem in the first place? Yeah. So my easy answer is I'm a whistleblower. If I wasn't a professor, who would have even listened to me? They would say, hey, you're some loser living in a basement complaining about how life's not fair. Look, life's been fantastic to me. I'm in this incredible office. I have this dream job for life. I still just want to go and let people know, at least, uh, you know, let taxpayers know you're being totally ripped off. We are spending an enormous amount of money in college. Most of this is really just wasted from the point of view of society. We are not going and getting some incredible gains. On top of it, also worth pointing out that most of this is, at least in the humanities and social sciences, it's really like a giant madrasa training Oh, uh, you know, attempting to go and brain uh, and give a bra create a brainwashed generation of left wing ideologues. I don't think they're that good at brainwashing because they're so boring, but and students barely show up to class. But still, that's another thing going on. But the, you know, the main thing is, all ideology aside, it is not a good economic investment because students are not learning very much, and that is going to be useful in the real world. Let's say school, for the most part here, as far as signaling goes, you come out of school. In some respect, it's for signaling submission, right? Submission to yeah. institutions. Yeah. Don't you think that's necessary to some degree for the larger functioning of society? I mean, if everybody was sort of like a Bill Gates entrepreneur trying to go off and do yeah. their own thing, it would be a different story. Right. So you know, submission, or what I call conformity, is extremely important in society. There's no I in team. It's really true. Right? And you know, even businesses that say they want creative people, they want people who are creative within a narrow band. You don't want someone who's so creative, like, here's my creative idea. I'm the CEO, you're <laughs> fired now. All right, so you don't want that. Uh, but I'd say is, first of all, there is a to there's another way that we can go and uh, first of all, find out how conformist people are, but also uh, another way of training people for conformity, this necessary conformity. And it's the one that has been used throughout almost all of human history and is still used more widely around the world, which is actually get a job. You get an entry level job, this does two things. First of all, it is a way of showing how conformist you are. Like, you're like well, did he get fired? Well, then you weren't, weren't conformist enough probably. I mean, there's other reasons, but that is a reason. And the other one is how about learning how to go and be part of a team? I mean, I actually say that in terms of training people for being part of a team, work is better than school. Uh, 
first of all, at minimum, there's just a difference between what we are pushing people to do in school versus work. A school is much more focused on fairness, for example, and work is much more fairness on much more focused on getting stuff done. Uh, so that's one difference. Uh, also, we have a, you know just a lot of coddling norms in modern education. I mean, also, like every child is a beautiful new snowflake, which uh, almost no job works on that principle. So I'd say that in terms of training people to get them ready for the real world, job is better, right? Uh, but in any case, um, you know, if you can simultaneously produce something and train people and signal, that is generally going to be a better option than one where really what we're doing is signaling alone and the other stuff we just wait to do until you get your job. Gotcha. Do you think we're measuring the wrong output when it comes to this in the first place? Like, for example, I don't remember most of what I learned in high school geometry, for instance, but that is probably natural because I'm not using high school geometry most of the time. Should we be testing for remembering what we learn or rather how to learn in the first place? Um, the answer is that that's been tested too. And the results are so depressing that people, well, that's uh, really the answer comes down to, you know, like, like learning how to learn there's almost no sign that that occurs in the real world. There's about 100 years of experimental psychology. If you want to go to Google Scholar and read the articles, uh, the correct phrase to Google is transfer of learning. You can also put in something like teaching critical thinking. The main punchline is that when people try to go and do this, there's just very little sign that it actually happens. Um, so a you know, way to think about it is this. If you are a teacher and the students learn what you explicitly try to teach them, you are lucky. That's success. That's the best success that anybody seems to have. If you start going and saying, ah, well, sure, they don't know, they, they failed to learn what I tried to teach them, but they definitely totally learned something that I didn't even, that wasn't even on the test. Yeah, that sounds like wishful thinking, and a whole lot of educational psychologists have concluded this. Uh, in particular, what is striking to me is that one does not go into educational psychology in order to say that education doesn't work very well. People go into that field because they are very hopeful and optimistic about it. And the actual uh, biography of most people working in this field is they go into the field thinking education is going to be really effective at teaching people how to learn, how to think, critical thinking. They then discover, wow, there's a pile of research saying otherwise. I'm going to be the person that shows it's all wrong. And they work on that for 20 years and it's like, oh my God, it's not wrong. <sighs> right, so this is at least well, my summary of literature. Basically, I'd say the main dissent, every now and then there's some guy who says, all right, look, nothing that we do works for teaching people how to think, except my technique. Mm. The main thing that's striking is for each such person that's there, they are, there are many such people, but each person is their own magic bullet. I don't know of anyone who's got converts to their magic bullet saying, like, we're all clustering around this one guy who has figured out the magic bullet for teaching people how to think. Now, obviously, some people do know how to think, mm. right? It does happen. The main thing we can say is it's just so rare that we can't pick it up in the data. So let's say I'm 18 years old again, and maybe I don't really know what I want to do with my life. Why don't we put this in the context of like liberal arts in general? So, you know, maybe on net what you're saying is true. Don't you think there's some kind of value in exposing yourself to a lot of different things? If, you know, maybe I think, even if I think I know what I want to do in life, maybe my calling is a, to be a marine biologist and I just need to take that class to, to get that, that push. I'd say there's immense value in exposing young people to a wide variety of realistic options. Mm. That's what school does not do. What school does is they expose you to a quite short list of pipe dreams. So like you could be a poet or a novelist, or you could be a, ma a trailblazing mathematician, or you could be a professional athlete, or you could be an historian. These are the career options that we expose kids to. And the total number of jobs in all these options comes up to like 100,000 jobs, maybe, for an entire country of 330 million people. It is a very bad approach. And especially what is crazy is we, we just keep shoving poetry at kids. Like hardly anyone actually likes poetry. Hardly anyone voluntarily consumes poetry. And yet you get 13 years of them shoving poetry in your face, trying to get you to like it. And then we say, see, we're exposing people to options. It's like, it's not exposing people to options. Here's what exposing people to options would really look like. You get two weeks each over the course of a 40-week semester of 20 different occupations where there's actually a lot of jobs in each occupation. That would be a good approach. So we've been talking about this at like sort of a larger societal level. What's your personal approach to learning? I mean, I'm looking across the room and there's like tons of books with your name on it. How do you go about doing this? 
Well, I mean, if I look back, I mean, honestly, it's largely just based upon what's personally intriguing me, what I'm curious about, and then I just start reading about it, and sometimes, like, okay, it's not really all that interesting, and or I, but other times, it's just like peeling off the layers of an onion. So the things that I've written books about, those are like the onion, where it's like, okay, I thought about this a bit. Okay, now there's more to learn. There's more to learn. It goes deeper. In terms of how I actually try to master a subject now, um, normally I start with Google Scholar, actually, and I just start typing in search words into Google Scholar, and so, all right, so what are the main things that are written about this? Let's read those. Let's see what those things cite. Let's see what's cited by the things that are cited by the things that are cited. Um, another thing that I do is when I find things that I like, I see, huh, is the author alive? Uh, yes, the author is alive, and then I email the author, and I ask them some questions. Mm -hmm. Or ask them tips or say, like, there's things that it seems like someone would have written something about it, but I can't find anything. Uh, for example, uh, psychologist Steve Cece at Cornell, he is maybe the most erudite man in all of psychology. He writes these fantastic articles explaining what is, it, what is everything we know about learning how to learn. And it's like there's like a thousand citations. I'm like, wow, All right, this guy knows his stuff. And, you can, and once you have introduced yourself to a person like that, and even, by the way, this is just not that hard. Most famous people, no matter like like famous in academia, they're not getting emails out only like ten emails a day from people that are curious about their work. They really aren't. Mm. They may be getting offer, you know, maybe may getting like crank emails, or they may be getting people that are pestering them to get a favor. But in terms of someone who's actually curious about the research, that's quite rare, even for the most famous people. So uh, it's often helpful to go to a person like that and say, like, I seems like this should have been written, but I don't know how to find it in Google Scholar. And then someone like Steve Cece will say, ah, well, what you don't understand, Brian, is that psychologists don't use the word forgetting very much. Uh, we use the word decay. And like, thank you, Steve. Now I type in decay and I get 100 papers. Is there anywhere in the world that you think is doing this right? Like doing education right? Nowhere is doing it right. I think there are places that are doing it better. I mean, especially I'm a fan of systems like Germany's and especially Switzerland's where they have a lot more focus on vocational education, where they try to find early teens and say, hey, it doesn't seem like you really like school very much. How about we go and train you to become a master metallurgist? I think that is a much more effective system. It's one that just, you know, it's common sense. And it isn't just good for the individual. It's also better for society. You'll just see much smaller underclasses in countries like this because the kind of kids that in the U.S. would end to end to, with them, excuse me, the kinds of kids in the U.S. would tend to end up being dropouts and then going to jail, instead become skilled craftsmen in countries like Germany and Switzerland. So that, I say, is a big improvement for society. Also, honestly, for them, you could either be a craftsman or in jail. I think it's pretty clear, yeah, better to be a craftsman. So sitting from here, I mean, we've been talking about the education system sort of as a whole, but from the office we're sitting in at, you know, a great university, from your perspective, what are the bigger problems in academia in general today? The main problem is that there's just way too much of it. There's immensely, insanely generous funding, which leads to large numbers of students who have no academic interest at all going to school. I was talking about credential inflation. We've got horrible credential inflation. We really do have a system where it's just hard to get a good job without a college degree. Often even the college degree is enough, you need to get some additional degree after that. This is caused by the generosity of the funding. The best thing to do would be to slash this funding dramatically, put me out of a job, I accept that, and then have people start real life at a much earlier age. So that is the big thing, is there's way too, way too many people going to school. Um, now in terms of, right, fine, but do you want to get rid of entirely? Like, you no, know, there's like some people who actually get something out of it. At minimum, so there are people that are learning the hard sciences. Even there, probably we are underusing apprenticeships, but it does make sense that for STEM, that um, having actual colleges does make sense. Uh, but I'd also say that there's always going to be some possibly very tiny group of people that just want to go and study literature out of sheer curiosity. Right? These are really rare, but they do exist. And I'd say for those people, also it makes sense for universities to continue and to offer a much scaled down version of what they are doing. What I would say is that in a well-functioning system, everyone who is on campus is either there to prepare for an occupation or because they love it. Two reasons to be there. 
either you've got to be fantastically curious, I just love Danish poetry, it's so awesome, or you're there saying, I need to go and master engineering so I can be an engineer. It's fine if the engineers don't love their subject because they're learning something practical. They're learning something that is actually useful in the real world. On the other hand, for the Danish poetry, it's, it's just consumption, so the only reason to do it would have to be that it gives you something uh, you know, in your spirit, your heart, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm very happy to say there's intrinsic value in that. You call it inherent value, but only for people, for, for people who actually sincerely like it. These people are one in a hundred out of students, maybe one in a 200, 300. Um, you know, the truth is even at the country's best schools, when professors talk about their students, they'll say, yeah, like most of my students don't even come to class. Mm. Steven Pinker wins prizes for best professor at Harvard and he gets like 50% attendance. Mm. Right? He is an incredible thinker. He's an incredible mind, incredible lecturer, but most of the people at Harvard don't care. If meritocracy is really the answer here, whether you know we're talking about this on the whole or within academia in general, should we abolish tenure? Hmm. Should we abolish tenure? I'll say yes, tenure is a terrible system. It benefits me immensely personally. <laughs> yeah. uh, but there's no other place in the world where we have something as crazy as the tenure system. I mean, most people don't even understand quite how good tenure is, so let me just walk you through it. The normal system is there's two kinds of professors. There's tenure, or two kinds of young professors. There's tenure track professors, and there are the others. All right, so the tenure track professors, these are the ones that basically have the good jobs. If you get a tenure track position, then after six years, the other more senior professors in your department will decide one of two things. They will either fire you or give you a dream job for life. Mm. There's two possibilities. And when I say dream job for life, I mean truly for life because due to U.S. labor law, it's essentially impossible to make a professor retire because they are too old. There's pretty much no system for that. So the only way that we really get rid of elderly professors is by giving them a bag of money to voluntarily resign. We will pay you money to go away. But you know, if you're like me, like I will never take that bag of money. I will just say, no, I'm staying. You can't make me. Right? And when I, if I may live to 100, I will still be a professor 100 years old. So that is how good the system is. What's the problem with it? The problem with it is that a lot of people have tenure who are terrible. They don't do any research, or the research is obviously total garbage. Also, they are often just terrible teachers, super boring. They, you know, I mean, again, like the people who brain try to brainwash their students in a way they're better because at least they're you not know, falling asleep when the guy's trying to brainwash you. In a way, I'd say like it's kind of your fault if you get brainwashed. You should have thought more critically about what the guy was saying. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's it's one where like the standards for having tenure revoked really comes down to committing a felony, right? <laughs> so that, that's one, especially particularly a felony against a student. And then there's also ones for you know, misconduct, basically sleeping with students. There's a couple other things, but that's pretty much it. There is right now a notorious case going on at the University of Pennsylvania where they're trying to revoke tenure from law professor Amy Wax for her unwoke statements. In the end, my guess is that she will win and they will give up. But even if she loses, she is one of the very, very few cases of someone having tenure revoked. Normally when someone says tenure was revoked, it's actually a bag of money. Mm. It wasn't really revoked. They were given a bag of money to resign. And the threat was basically, well, we won't like you if you don't take the bag of money. It's like, all right, fine, I'll take the bag of money. So yeah, so tenure is a very dysfunctional system. Just imagine any other job where people are told you have this job for life regardless of performance, just don't commit felonies, and just imagine what kind of performance you get out of people. I mean, I'd say like the only good thing to say about tenure is it protects the small number of professors that actually say something that is offensive to other professors. So yeah, like for me, it actually does serve a, at least a, a, a useful purpose in one sense, which is it keeps me speaking my mind. Of course, you might say, yeah, we don't care what you have to say that much, Brian, or you could go speak your mind on your own time. And I appreciate that, so it's not wrong. Um, but, I mean, it is kind of crazy when you think about it that the main rationale for tenure is basically to protect people, people's right to say controversial things, and yet most professors will never say anything controversial in their whole lives. They're boring as hell. Let's shift gears again to selfish reasons to have more kids. I think this calls for another kind of 
level set here. What's like the, I guess, the elevator pitch, right? It seems that like variation in parenting within reason, within reason, has no significant long-term effects. So the idea here is like, take it easy, maybe invest some of that energy in having more kids. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of break it down to people? Normally, I would just start with, you know what you, you know what helicopter parenting is, right? You've seen it. You've seen how many parents make their lives miserable. They are making their lives miserable because of a theory. The theory is that if they make their lives miserable, they will give their kids a much better future. This is a testable theory. How can we test it? We can test it with studies of kids that are adopted and with twins. These are the two best ways that we can separate nature from nurture and find out how important nurture really is. When people do this, and they've been doing it for 60 years, they have reached a surprising result, which is that nurture is greatly overrated, nature is greatly underrated. What this means is that helicopter parents can give themselves a guilt-free break. The misery that they are experiencing is self-imposed. It doesn't have the incredible benefits they imagine that it has. So step one is just stop suffering needlessly. But then step two is to reconsider how many kids do you really want to have. Normally when people are thinking about kids, what they say is not, I hate kids. Some people do that. They're disgusting. Kids are gross. I don't like them. Normally they just say, it's too much work. I'm the sac I don't want to make the sacrifices. What I'm saying is we've got a lot of high quality research saying that you can cut back on those sacrifices a lot, which then means that the kids that you were considering having are a lot cheaper and basic economics. When the price of things goes down, the quantity that you want, that the quantity that it makes sense for you to consume goes up. Uh, the way that I think about my book is it's basically a coupon for kids. It's saying you can get kids half price. If someone says, I don't like kids, fine, throw out the coupon. On the other hand, if there's someone who does like kids, we'll say, oh, maybe now I'll go from two to three. So if the premise here is that like most of what you're going to do as a parent like doesn't really have that much of a long-term effect on you know the success or whatever metric you want to use for your kids mm -hmm. in general, what are some areas that do have an effect, if any, that were maybe surprising to you? So like empirically, right. where can you give the best advice for a parent? Right. Right. So it's very important to distinguish between short run and long run effects. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the adoption and twin studies are looking at long run effects. And this is where we see very little effective parenting. On the other hand, there's also research on short run effects. Uh, some of the ones that are highest value to parents, there's great research on getting a baby to sleep for the night. There are simple time tested techniques that do work. Basically, it comes down to let them cry it out. There's different versions of let them cry it out, but let, if you let a baby cry it out, don't do this in the first month. They actually need that food. But once they are a bit older, say three months, they are biologically totally capable of sleeping through the night. There are many parents that keep picking them up every single time they cry, and then they keep uh, crying and getting picked up. Uh, but we've got a lot of good research saying that if you just go and let them cry it out, they will stop and they'll sleep for the night which then takes by itself takes away a lot of the suffering of parents of young kids. I know a lot of parents who lose sleep for three or four years, even five years, because they refuse to go and apply this technique, or maybe they don't know, or maybe they're stubborn. Uh, something else that uh, works very well in terms of short-run behavior is just discipline. Mild punishment for bad behavior works. Particularly mild, consistent punishment. A lot of what parents do is let their kids do whatever they want and then tell the parent gets really angry and then they have a flip out and then they have some random punishment, which often has almost nothing to do with what the kid was doing at the time. It's more of whether the parent was having a bad day or whatever. Don't do that. What the experiment the, of an actual experimental research on different styles of getting kids to behave says is that you should have consistent, mild punishments. Uh, to be fair, there's no experiments on harsh punishments because this wouldn't be approved by a human subjects board. But what we do know is that mild but consistent punishments just like put the kid in the naughty corner. It's just got to be done every time the kid misbehaves. And that is a reliable way of improving kids' behavior and it's a great way of getting kids to be better roommates. Right? This does not mean that because you put them in the naughty corner or didn't that they're going to end up in jail. That's crazy. But it does mean that while you are living with them when you're young, this is a much better approach. Okay, so let's say I can have, you know, two times the number of kids that I have. Uh -huh. Already, I don't have any kids, but, you know, at whatever point. Uh, what are some of the, like, positive externalities that I get from, from having more kids in the first place? Hmm. 
So while positive externalities is probably not the right word, positive externalities would be the one would be benefits that go to total strangers. Uh, I, mean, I think what you're thinking of are just what are good things for you personally. Yeah. I mean, here honestly, I would say I don't know that much more than other people do. It's like like what do people like doing with their kids? Well. They like going to play sports with their kids. They like going and doing activities with their kids. They like going and taking a walk with their kids. They like watching a movie with their kids. Basically, it's the companionship. It's also the companionship of somebody that knows a lot less than you, that knows a lot less than you, but is visibly improving very quickly. Right. So, like, what's depressing about elder care? They're not improving. They're getting worse over time. This is what is so much more inspiring about taking care of kids is you can just see them getting better all the time. And they're like they're learning, they're improving, they're growing. Um, so again, if there was someone who just said, I don't like any of those things, I'd say, yeah, well, probably kids aren't for you. I mean, the only thing I would say is, well, it might be different if they were your own kids. I mean, honestly, I've actually met a lot of people say they want to have a pile of kids and they don't know any kids. And for them, I'll say, you know, I think you should meet some kids. Um, don't, you know, obviously you don't have to decide to have six kids all in one batch. But in any case, um, it may be that you don't understand what you're getting into and you should go and meet them and hang out with them. Um, just given how low our fertility is, there are a lot of adults who just barely know any kids. And I do encourage people before making up their minds to go and meet some. Uh, one way, you know, both ways, whether you think you want them or don't, meet them and find out. Okay, so forthcoming book, um, Build Baby Build, The Science and Ethics of Housing Regulation. Again, maybe a level set here. As far as I understand it, the thesis is sort of that, you know, supply and demand is the obvious sort of story for what's wrong with the housing market. Mm -hmm. Um, which in part is true, but it, surprise, surprise, it's actually um, restrictions on the free market that are that are sort of the main culprit here, um, not lack of supply. Mm -hmm. Walk us through, I guess, the elevator pitch here. Sure thing. All right, just imagine walking in any city that has really expensive housing. All right, say San Francisco. Sure. Have you been to San Francisco? No, I haven't. I live uh, in New York, though. So ah, maybe that okay. Way. I mean, New York is also bad, although not nearly as bad as San Francisco. All right. So anyway, yeah. So you walk around New York, walk around, say, Greenwich Village. All right. And you take a look at the price tags of those buildings. All right. Like, what would it cost to live here? It's like, man, it's really expensive. And it's like, huh, how come these buildings are only three stories tall? We have the technology. We have had the technology for over a century of, of building a hundred story skyscraper there. And yet it hasn't been done. Why not? Because it is totally illegal. It would be so hard to get that permission the number of bureaucratic hurdles you would have to get through in order to even begin to consider possibly trying is so high that people don't do it. And as a result, we have severely restricted supply of housing. Uh, if you just look around Central Park, you can see there's a few skyscrapers there, but most of it is quite stubby housing. We have the technology to build vastly more housing inside of New York City, and yet it hasn't been done. It would be super profitable because if you imagine going and replacing a three-story building with a hundred-story building, imagine how much more you collect in rent for the hundred-story building, right? So why hasn't it been done? Because it's illegal, of course. That you know, The general thing that businesses do is if there is something that you can build where the money that you'll get exceeds the cost of production, you will do it as long as you're allowed. Uh, the, um, the regulations vary very widely. There's just a long list. It really is death by a thousand cuts, but you got regulation of building height, you got regulation of, of the minimum lot size. You've got regulations saying it has to be single family homes. You got regulation of parking. Often it's just you have to get through three different boards and any one of the three can veto it. Anyway, uh, there's been a lot of research on how much of the increase in housing price can be explained by this regulation. And I'd say a good punchline is that if we had no regulation at all, or indeed just much lighter regulation, the price of housing for the whole United States would be about half of what it is. And in the most desirable areas of the country, it could be easily be like one-tenth of what it is. So I guess that begs the question, right? Is, is the answer really more skyscrapers? This is like a, a total side note, but I, I heard an interesting statistic that New York City is actually one of the greenest cities per capita just because of, I guess, the density to begin with. But maybe the most like Radical example here is um, regulating or deregulating Central Park. So you can build skyscrapers in Central Park. Mm -hmm. Isn't there like a non-explicit or explicit value in like the loss of kind of natural beauty that would make somewhere like New York even less pleasant to live in than it already is? Hmm. I mean, I'm puzzled that you would say even less pleasant given the, how expensive it is to live there. Obviously, the people that are there think that it's very pleasant on balance. On I balance. Mean, yes, on balance. Yeah. So... 
you know, like, you know, in general, like anytime someone talks about how a place is bad to live, it's like, well, let's look at the rents. Mm. Let's look at the housing prices. The very, fa- the very fact that you could go and sell your apartment in New York City and move to some place that is much cheaper and much less densely populated is conclusive proof that when you add up the value of all the good things that you're getting from there, subtract the value of all the bad things, that the good far outweighs the bad. It's a, to- it's a total trade-off, completely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, in terms of something of any, like any particular thing, like we're going to go and allow development of Central Park, that's where I'll say, um, well, maybe that's a good idea. The key question is, if Central Park were privately owned, so you had to go and pay admission fees in order to get there, then what would be done? My guess is that they would go and develop a lot of it, but not all. So basically, they would still keep a large area. There'd be admission fee fees that people would pay, and that would be viable. But at the same time, it wouldn't be nearly as big as it is because people do not appreciate the full size of Central Park. I mean, this is, you know, just like I was saying, actions speak louder than words. One of the really great things about markets is we don't just listen to people and have them say, oh, Central Park, we shouldn't lose a foot of that. Yeah, sure, that sounds really good. But rather, we can go and see what will people pay for when there's conflicting uses. Like, Like, we can either have another skyscraper or we could have a little bit more land in Central Park which one is actually more important is revealed by actions, by what people will pay for it. That is, I think, the best way of thinking about it. So yeah, obviously, it's really nice to have parks. You know what else is really nice to have in New York? Restaurants. But nobody says we need to have a bunch of regulations ensuring an adequate supply of restaurants. Those exist because customers pay for them. Right? And if past customers want a different kind of restaurant, they get it. Um, you know, if they stop liking the kinds of restaurants that they've had in the past, those restaurants go out of business. It's a much better way of actually satisfying true human wants as reflected by actions rather than fake human wants as, re- as reflected by speeches. Gotcha. All right, let's talk about evil politicians. Not too long ago, I interviewed Bradley Tusk, who ran a campaign for Andrew Yang from Mike Bloomberg. Mm-hmm. Um, and he himself says that politicians are desperately self-loathing people who can't live without the validation of holding office. So we can, we can talk about demagoguery and evil people. But first, I want to touch on mass opinions and influencing those. How do mass opinions change? How does ideology propagate itself? And how does this change in, I guess, an area, era of, of social media? Hmm. Right, the easy answer is that people are highly conformist crit- creatures, and most people change their mind just because other people change their mind. All right, like, how do people decide that the trans issue was even something that is worth discussing one way or the other? Other people started saying it was worth discussing, and then it built on itself. All right, so that's the easy answer. It's true, but it's not that satisfying because it's like, all right, yeah, but what determines what's going to be the thing that people conform to? Right, and that one is just really hard to answer. I mean, if I knew the answer, I could have predicted what would become big issues in the last decade, and I didn't see that. There are there was a long list of issues where I was just like, no way. Like, like, I mean, it wasn't even that I said, no way will that become a big issue. If you had just said, make a list of 100 things that might become big issues, I just wouldn't have said that could be something that would be on the list. And yet it did get on the list. Like, defund the police. Like, would never have occurred to me 10 years ago that that would be discussed by any notable number of people. Um, of course, I, mean, I am very good at saying that some things will stay issues, but that's easy. I mean, I did have a colleague who said, once Obama becomes president, then racism will stop being discussed in America, and I just laughed in his face. And I said, yeah, right. Good luck with that. And I was right on that. Uh, so you know, the normal pattern is whatever people think is really important, they will continue to think it's really important. But um, that's most of what I'm able to say. I guess that I, like, the other thing I would say, like globally, we see, like you were mentioning, this tendency to globalization. So westernization is a very powerful force globally. There is a tendency for countries to move in a westernizing direction. Governments, especially dictatorships, are pretty desperately trying to stop that. But you need the North Korean level of tyranny to really almost stop it. And even there, it's only almost stop it. They're still smuggling in South Korean shows on thumb drives and stuff like that. By that logic, I mean, if everything is kind of a medic at the end of the day, and I'm only going to be arguing for what the people around me say is worthwhile arguing for, does that make free markets overrated in the first place? If like people don't have as much individual agency as we're ascribing to them? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, people are most conformist in the realm of words, right? Actions are a different story. 
because you actually have to personally live with the consequences of actions. With words, really, the almost the only consequence normally is whether other people like you or not. But with actions, on the other hand, it's like, hey, I do something that's socially disapproved. Other people won't like me, but I like it. If you look at people's behavior, you'll see that almost everyone does a long list of things that are highly socially disapproved because they like them. Right? Because, you know, so people go and watch reality TV. Does anyone want to give a speech saying, reality TV is the best TV, it's what brings out the best in human nature? No, but why do people watch it? Because they enjoy it. Because it's fun. And the same goes, like, like just like even drinking. You, know, you want to give the speech. I'm, as a proud consumer of alcohol, uh, here are my seven arguments for drinking alcohol. Right. Rather, what people normally do is there's a bunch of alcohol awareness, which is almost always anti-alcohol. Now, yeah, yes, alcohol awareness. And then um, most people keep drinking because they enjoy it. Uh, so I say that people have a lot more agency than their words would, in would indicate. Really, the realm of words is where we tend to go and to say what we're supposed to say, whereas with our actions, we do what we actually want to do. I mean, even there, obviously, there's a difference between what you say to your close friends and what you say to a broader audience. So I would say that people have more agency when they're with the people that they trust. So let's say, like, you're a politician. You've been a lot of things. You've been the president during this conversation. Now you're a just a, a lowly politician. How do you get ideas into the mainstream to begin with? Is this social proof? Is it endorsement? Is it, is it memes? Like, what's the sort of main mechanism here in your mind? Yeah, I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't intellectual arguments. It is not the kind of thing that I do that works. Mm. Now, as to what it actually is, I mean, a lot of it honestly comes down to personality. If you have a personality that people like, then there's a fairly wide range within which you can do almost anything you want. I mean, Trump is the most bizarre example. It's like, well, what do you mean? He has a terrible personality. Not in the eyes of a lot of people. A lot of people think his personality is great. Which again, this is another thing that I just could not have predicted 10 years ago. Like people think that's a great personality, but he's a pig. He's like, well, apparently pigs are great in terms of their personalities. So uh, one thing is so just having a likable personality gives a politician a whole lot of latitude. I mean, another thing, honestly, that gives you a lot of latitude is just working on stuff that is really boring that matters. Often there are regulations that are so picayune, so specific. It can be hard even to explain to people what the regulation is about, and yet it makes a big difference in the real world. This is where like, most of my optimism for like, housing, housing deregulation comes from. It's like, look, could we go and lower the minimum lot size from 10,000 square feet to 9,500? Could we do that? It's like, well, all right, if people are sleeping, it's like, all right, maybe we could get away with it. Maybe we could. All right, so there's that. Um, in terms of other things to do, so like you know, a big part is just you know getting people excited, getting your base of people that are thrilled by you. Uh, I do think it's true that people overrate the power of Twitter and social media. You know, there's a certain small segment of the population that's really into it. People criticize people in the last election for trying to run for president of Twitter, and I think that does make sense. Guess what? Biden won. Biden didn't win Twitter. <laughs> but uh, so uh, there is that. Uh, you know, there's you know, a lot of other things going on. It's you know, it's, it is complicated. Um, and I and I would say, like, you know, probably the people that actually do this for a living know better than I do. So, how do you find like good politicians to propagate this in the first place? Like, do you think it's possible to, if politicians are evil and demagoguery is everywhere, um, is is it possible to find like the right types of people or incentivize them to be going for these jobs in the first place? Hmm. I mean, let me just back up. So on this question of how evil are politicians, the main argument that I use here is what I call the Spider-Man principle. It just says, with great power comes great responsibility. So this is not even a question of a politician's evil because they disagree with me, which is you know, so easy to say. This is almost what everybody thinks. I say, you know, like, how about this standard? If you're going to do something that has very drastic effects on millions of people, you ought to go and carefully investigate the actual effects of your policy. With great power comes great responsibility. If you've got the power of life and death in your hands, you should not decide lightly. You shouldn't decide based upon what is most amusing to you. You shouldn't decide based upon this will get me elected. It's like, look, it's a, for you it's a job, but for a million people it's life or death. Right? It is extremely morally wrong just to say, yeah, well, a million people have to die, but I really want this job. 
Right now, I'd say this is a moral principle. I think it's pretty hard for someone to seriously argue against. It's not one that would be controversial if stated. And yet, once you state it, to realize, well, what actual share of politicians who do have the power of life and death routinely, what share of them actually put even an hour into investigating calmly the effects of different policies versus what will get them elected? Right? I think this one is, if you're honest, you realize, yeah, hardly any politicians are putting much intellectual effort into what are the true effects of policies. How can I go and discover whether what I want to believe is actually true? Instead, there's a pile of wishful thinking and then just a pile of emotional talk in order to go and get people on your side. And the question of, is this stuff literally true, generally doesn't even come up. Again, of course, it's possible politicians are secretly under the covers reading social science, but it seems pretty ridiculous. Now, in terms of what you could do to get better people involved, I mean, honestly, there is a lot of self-selection here. The people that only tell people what they want to hear and don't care about actual effects and just care about winning tend to win. It's true in the Olympics, and it's true in politics. In terms of what you could do to try to incentivize better people, I mean, of course, you could be someone that does all of the due diligence. You could go and read a lot of social science. You could figure out the answers, and then you could find some very charismatic demagogues that are, that are happy to go and say what happens to be true, this would not really be a case of getting a morally better person in charge. It would be a case of you going and basically, through your philanthropy and your support, you are circumventing a lot of the harm that is normally caused by politicians' evil, which is you basically did the politician you know, what you did what the politician should have done. You, know, you went and ex exercised great responsibility for the power that an irresponsible person is going to exercise. You then find the right person and you back them. So, say so that is probably the best thing that you could do. If it sounds hard, yeah, sure is. I've got a couple more for you before okay. we close out. Sure thing. Now that we can look back on COVID more clearly, we've been talking a lot about free markets and open borders and people sort of voting with their feet spatially, like where they can move. What do you think the future of labor markets looks like in a world of presumably um, increasing remote work? Yeah, that's a great question. So the main thing about remote work is, is this finally going to be a way to effectively open up labor markets, not just one or 2% as they are now, but to open them up at least 30%, 40%. It seems very likely that in the medium run, businesses will say, there's so many jobs that we're hiring domestic teleworkers for at greatly inflated wages, and we could go and hire foreigners who can't get immigration papers, but they can legally telework, and we will go and save a lot of money and get somebody that is at least almost as good. So yeah, it seems like over the course of 10 or 20 years that this almost has to lead to a substantially increased demand for labor, for, for third world labor from first world countries. The main thing you can imagine is first world countries actually going and expanding their immigration regulations so that it's just illegal to hire foreigners even for telework. Pretty hard to enforce, but for major corporations, you just go and say, hey, if we catch you, we crush you. Right, so it does seem that despite some obvious disadvantages, and I think a lot of employers do think that there's extra shirking going on with telework, but still, Often there are jobs where you have an idea about how much they accomplish per week. You don't need to go and watch them every second to say, look, your, pro your production is low, your production is high. For jobs like that, it does seem like there's just going to be immense economic pressure to go and outsource that. So I do think that this will tend to be the biggest undermining of immigration laws that we have seen in a century happening over the next 10 to 20 years. The only doubt is, could it really be that people are just so hard to motivate when they are not face-to-face, -face, that it's just not going to work. I know there's a lot of offices that have been moving more and more back to in-person work, and managers just have a sense of, like, there's something wrong going on here. we got to go and get people back in the office. I know a lot of people that are having fights with employees over this. The employees don't want to come back, and the firm totally does want them to come back. You know, Elon Musk had a thing where I think he's, well, he returned just to full-time in-person for everybody and just said if you don't like it go don't go go don't work for somebody else mm -hmm. yeah 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 okay i've got one more for you it's the same one i ask at the end of every interview um which is i mean inside or outside the scope of what we've talked about today 
what should more people be thinking about? Hmm. I say more people should be thinking about you know, deregulation of immigration. Right? It is the biggest win that, we, that, that is sitting right before us right now, and yet hardly anyone cares about it very much. The extent of which they do care, it's basically on the most symbolic things of refugees or what are we going to do about people at the border. Like, like That's not the important thing. The important thing is this incredible waste of human talent. Billions of people are wasting their lives in countries where if they could just move away from them somewhere else, they could accomplish so much more with their lives and watch the harm to the rest of the world. They, they work, they produce. Why not? Let's see, in terms of other policy issues, so I think yeah, housing deregulation is, is the next biggest one. Like we could, If we could just go and get the pieces of paper approved, we could cut the price of housing in half. There could be an incredible flourishing of architecture with so many other add-on benefits that I talk about in my book. I call housing deregulation the panacea policy. Like We can deal with poverty, with inequality, with mobility, with fertility, with crime. There's so many things that housing deregulation would improve. Let's see, other things of importance. Um, let's see, I talk a lot about the folly of universal redistribution. If you're going to go and take money from rich people and give it to poor people, there may be an argument. There's no argument for taking money from everyone and giving it to everyone. It's just folly, and yet this stuff is so popular and it costs trillions of dollars per year. Uh, nuclear power. I mean, like, it's again, so regulated and yet so awesome. People keep talking about, oh, we got to find some new alternative energy source. It's here. We've got one that is so much better than you could expect to get in your wildest dreams. We've had it for almost 100 years, and we're not using it out of total innumeracy and paranoia. Let's see. So those are some of the main policy ones. In terms of bigger questions, I mean, one of the main ones that I just think about is the contrast between words and actions, the, just the ubiquity of lies in social life and the harm that they do, the way that people care primarily about how policies sound rather than how well they work. Right? If you just listen to the way that people talk, you can just see that so much of what they say is almost deliberately calculated to sound as good as possible regardless of truth. So just to get people to put a higher value on truth, uh, and you focus on, like, instead of saying things that are pretty truths or pretty lies, how about just figure out a way to make the truth more palatable? Um, I mean, in terms of like uh, other under other un, other understudy things like life extension, you all we all die. We're all the clock's ticking for all of us. The amount of of effort that goes into it is really quite low. If like, somehow this could be solved, it would be the greatest thing that ever happened. Let's see, uh, fertility decline. Um, you know, that's something where, again, it's, I don't uh, agree with the people who think that it's going to be a disaster. I, what I say, rather, it's, gonna, it's just an incredible missed opportunity. So many more people could have enjoyed life. They didn't. Right? What a, what a, what a, you know, oh, you know, what a disappointment. Like, things could have been so much better. Let's see. I mean, other things that I think people really, like, just don't think about nearly enough, like, you know, like actually how to be happy. You know, human happiness is something that almost everybody pursues, and yet... There's already a lot of evidence that people are doing it the wrong way, right? People you know, put way too little emphasis on friendship, for example. Right? We saw during COVID, like friendship almost disappears, and people say, "Well, it's worth it." Like, is it worth it? Is it worth it? No, no. I think you know, friendship is more important than preventing COVID. Right? Would have been better just to do nothing. Food for thought, Brian. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank this you. has My been pleasure. a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just if we can stand still for 10 seconds, we're going to do a ringtone. Oh, ringtone. Yeah.